Hello everybody and welcome to the fifth in our series of online panel discussions, a series called Conversations on Glass sponsored by Apice. Today's event is called Going Green, Glass and Sustainability, a very important topic to be discussed as part of this year's edition of the Venice Glass Week, which is an international festival taking place here in Venice and Murano from the 4th to the 12th of September 2021. My name is Camilla Purden and I am the festival coordinator. The festival is organized by a number of institutions, a committee made up of the Stanza del Vetro, the Fondazione Giorgio Cini, together with the Fondazione Musei Civici di Venezia, the Istituto Veneto di Scienze, Lettere ed Arti, Consorzio Promovetro Murano and the Comune di Venezia. So this year, for the second year running, we're very happy to be uh, presenting to you as part of the festival, a series of daily online panel discussions, Conversations on Glass by Apice. Apice, as you may well know, is a leading company in the field of transportation for art and particularly with expertise in glass. So every day we've been presenting discussions on various topics relating to different aspects of the glass world, uh, involving high profile speakers from Venice, Murano and beyond, with the aim of providing a platform for reflection and discussion about different aspects of glass. The conversations are taking place in English um, because we're really keen to, to open up the festival as widely as we can to engage with different glass um, areas around the world, and especially for those people who can't unfortunately make it to Venice this year perhaps because of travel, travel uh, uh, issues. Uh, so, as I mentioned, today's event is called Going Green, Glass and Sustainability. And we're really delighted to be joined and, uh, by Paola Ravenna, who is the European Policies Unit Director for the Comune di Venezia. Paola will be moderating our talk today. Paola graduated in business economy at Kafoskari University, and she studied urban management at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. She chose to work for the public and has spent more than 20 years working for the city of Venice, the Comune di Venezia, developing sustainable integrated urban projects in the framework of European cohesion policy. And in this role, she's had the opportunity to look at, to learn from and be inspired by the solutions that other European cities have adopted with a view to bringing them potentially and integrating them into life here in Venice. And her aim is to contribute to social innovation and to increase the quality of life for European citizens, which is extremely admirable. And we're delighted to have Paola with us today. Um, Paola will be moderating while we are streaming live on YouTube, we'll be inviting questions from anybody who's watching around the world. So by all means, if you have a question for the panel, please do put it into the chat function and Paola will do her best to relay those questions to the panelists at the end of the session. Before I hand over to Paola to kick off the conversation though, I'd just like to introduce a representative of our sponsor, Apice, Helen Vincenzi, to say a few words. So Helen, over to you. Buongiorno, hi, good morning to everybody. We are very happy about this uh, conversation that we are taking part of every day. So uh, I just uh, um, would like to point that Apice is, is doing its best to, to get green. Um, the, we are worried for the environmental situation, so we try our best to, uh, to help uh, saving and avoiding, um, I mean, say, saving the, the materials and avoiding wasting of wood, plywood, and all the materials that we use, for example, for the packaging. So, um, just the main thing that we do is to recycle our crates. Uh, is one thing that we, we think it's very important to avoid wasting of materials. Uh, so we keep uh, the external part of the crate, we have a big storage for the empty crate and we keep them in order to use them as much as possible. So uh, once we get, um, we know that we have to pack the work, we check if we have available crates for that work, we refurbish, we fix uh, uh, the part that can be uh, ruined or something and uh, we prepare it for the new artwork that we have to transport with making the internal part brand new. So the internal part is always clean and prepared 
tailor made for the work that we have to, to, to transport, but we save the external part. And this is very important to us because uh, we don't need to make every time new crates and buying new material. So we save uh, material and we help also our clients because in this way we can rent the crates instead of selling them because we, 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 we can rent because we use them many times as much as we can of course when the crate is not usable anymore of course we throw them away but uh, as much as we can we do it so we think that is very important for I mean to help the environment. Thank you so much Helen. You're welcome. And yes so over to you Paola thank you very much indeed. Uh, you're welcome uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you, Camilla, for the presentation. As Camilla said, I'm Paola Ravenna, and I work for the city of Venice. I'm also, I'm also original, originally from Venice. I was born in young grew up, studied in Venice and working. I had this experience of studying urban management in, uh, at uh, the Erasmus uh, Rotterdam University. And uh, now I'm trying to apply uh, what I learned to improve uh, uh, my city, the quality of life, the city where I live, especially using a European funds uh, from the cohesion policy, European co cohesion policy. Uh, today, I'm really honored to moderate this uh, discussion panel on going, uh, as Camilla said, going green uh, glass and sustainability. Because in my experience working for the, um, for the city of Venice, I had the opportunity to uh, to lead a group, uh, that a group that is still trying to study how to make the glass uh, more clean, uh, talking about environment. And so I had the opportunity to get in touch with part of the panelists that are with us today. Uh, that I first say welcome to them also, and thank you them for uh, accepting the invitation for uh, participating to this panel. Um, starting from uh, the scientist part uh, that we have today with us, uh, Antonio Pires de Matos uh, from uh, Portugal. Uh, Antonio is the founder of Vicarte, that is an institute that is studying the composition of uh, uh, glass and ceramic, research unit glass and ceramics uh, of uh, the arts. Uh, yes, arts is uh, the, the right word because we are talking about artistic class, especially, is the focus. And uh, together, like Antonio, also Martin Marshall from England, he studied uh, the component of the glass. In fact, he's from Glass Technology Services, uh, melting uh, uh, research development lead and research development project team, as you can you can say, and then uh, we have, uh, I have to say, uh, the owner, or, no, not the owner, but the person <laughs> working <laughs> and living in Murano, that is uh, Piero Nazon, CEO from uh, Nazon Moretti Company, an historical uh, uh, company uh, from Murano, uh, that uh, he, he can give uh, more than the rest of the group, uh, uh, the general, uh, 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 information idea what's going on in the island and uh, uh, then we have the uh, the artist uh, the artistic part uh, together with us today there is Emmanuel Bablet from France and uh, France about at least or, or Italian almost <laughs> no, designer oh, and, and designer and founder of uh, Bablet design studio uh, prime matter platform and the first floor co-working in uh, Portugal and uh, uh, last but not the least, Roberto Gasparotto, uh, interior and designer consultant. He also has uh, had a long experience working uh, in Murano, in a big company. And uh, so I think uh, we have today the opportunity to look at this. Uh, this topic that we say the topic is uh, uh, glass and sustainability. Uh, um, more than one time we talk uh, together as a city uh, about uh, um, sustainability in a different uh, way. Uh, sustainability means that, uh, especially uh, because of the recent uh, reg European regulation 
on uh, the uh, pollution of the components of the glass. Uh, sustainability means that the glass has to be clean, uh, has not produced uh, pollution uh, in, the, in, the, in the ambient. Uh, both uh, talking about components and talking about production uh, with emission in the air. And, uh, uh, but what, uh, especially for me, working for the city is also very important. And because of the first two um, uh, situation topics arguments, uh, the sustainability means that uh, uh, the production of the artistic glass of Murano can uh, can go on in the, in the time, can, uh, can last as a production. That means for us to keep uh, 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 enhancing the culture of production. We know that uh, the production of glass uh, in Murano starting around uh, 1,000, so it's uh, more than 1,000 that we produce glass. And uh, since uh, 1,292, all the companies, even the one in, uh, settled in Venice, has to move to go to Murano. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's so important, more than ever, that going green means for us that the production of the artistic glass can stay in the island of Murano. And all the related things, all the related um, spillover that uh, bring uh, to the island, keeping the population living in the island and not became uh, what uh, uh, is the risk that, that can became only a touristic destination, uh, but it's more an alive uh, situation. So uh, together, starting uh, from uh, the situation uh, with uh, Piero Nazon, the situation of Murano, we can, we can start with the, with the panelists. And uh, so, uh, Piero, um, the floor is yours. Uh, and Thank you, Paola. <laughs> Buongiorno to everybody. I'm uh, Piero Nazon. Ciao, Roberto. <laughs> I'm Piero Nazon from uh, uh, Nazon Moretti Company. Uh, this is a family company since uh, 1923. I'm uh, one of the owner and uh, the CEO of the glass company. So I was asked uh, uh, to give you some general guidelines uh, concerning the glass art um, situation in Murano nowadays. Um, uh, we have more or less uh, 50 uh, active uh, glass factory in different sizes. Uh, most of these uh, are uh, small sizes uh, from five to 10 employees, few medium size uh, from 10 to 20, and very, very few in large size uh, from 20 to 50. And this, uh, and each company uh, is specialized uh, in uh, particular production with, uh, with his uh, know-how, his color and uh, his technique. For example, who, who is able to make uh, drinking glass uh, is not able to make chandeliers. Uh, or uh, uh, who make chandelier is not able to make uh, heavy, heavy sculpture uh, and so on. And every day we have to, to make efforts uh, to solve uh, different problems. Uh, uh, first of all, to start finding human resources. Uh, this is a very, very, very uh, hard problem uh, to, 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 to resolve uh, for all of us. The second is uh, dealing with the environmental uh, problems such as uh, atmosphere pollution, waste water from uh, primary and secondary uh, production, and uh, discharging the, the waste materials. And last uh, but not least, uh, uh, the replacement uh, of the forbidden raw materials, chemical, chemical elements uh, like uh, cadmium, like uh, arsenic, uh, like opal to make the, the white filigree, for example. And this is an assist for Antonio and uh, uh, Martin that will follow me <laughs> in this panel. <laughs> uh, okay. So, sorry. sorry. Okay. Paola. Pa no, so, no. What uh, we have done in the past uh, as a glass company. But for the atmosphere pollution, uh, we made several experiences in the past, uh, like uh, the oxygen fusion. Uh, personally, we made this kind of experience here in my glass factory, and we achieved a very, very important uh, re result. Uh, we reduce uh, 
the Python fusion, and this uh, uh, allows us allow us uh, allowed us uh, to reduce the atmosphere uh, pollution and emission. It was a very 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 strong result for us. Uh, another kind of technology uh, is uh, the, the the electrical fusion that uh, was. Uh, was uh, uh, made an experience by another glass company here in Murano with uh, the primary uh, electric uh, national electric company, Enel. Uh, for the other problem, uh, the, the, the solution of the everyday is to recycle the water, the, the wastewater in the, in the production process. A partial recycle of the of the, the waste melted glass uh, with a new uh, fusion, and uh, another kind of uh, um, solution that we could uh, you could use is, is uh, to to catch the, the thermic energy that we produce in a very 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 large uh, in a very very large size uh, for domestic use or to 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 make uh, hot water for civil war, for civil use. So. The technology uh, is available on the market now from since uh, several years. So what is the problem? So now is it to to to, to make the action is uh, for uh, to achieve the environmental environmental sustainability is uh, to make decision. We have to make a decision, and most of all, have to find the financial uh, uh, resources. That is, uh, I think. Uh, uh, the problem of uh, all of uh, the glass factory in Murano now, because the, the economic, uh, um, the economic uh, uh, problems uh, is very, very, very are very, very strong for for, for all of us. So I think uh, I have to to, to give uh, my the, the to the next panelist like Antonio or uh, uh, Martin that. Uh, will explain, of course, uh, about uh, the chemical uh, raw materials uh, forbidden now and uh, the solution that we have given, achieved. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sure. Piero. And uh, it's interesting what you say uh, about uh, uh, the, the technology is changing in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, this is, think, is something that uh, now we have to find a way uh, uh, to apply to the glass artistic glass production. But as you said, uh, we need extra uh, resources, extra funds, because yep. it's been a, a huge, big investment and uh, uh, the companies are uh, small, uh, medium, but more, small size. So the investment on the, uh, on the balance is very uh, important, uh, the percentage, so we look for. But first, uh, we uh, we listen uh, we listen to the um, uh, scientists uh, about uh, the composition of the glass, uh, the, uh, the the way in, in which it can be uh, uh, work, and uh, so all the characteristics starting from uh, Martin Marshall, and uh, the, the is is yours. And uh, can we go with the presentation, the PowerPoint the presentation? Okay, for Martin. That's perfect. So, my name's Martin Marshall. I'm a glassmaker. I've been making a glass for about 35 years. I'm, I'm a big fan of the Japanese way of looking things. So for a Japanese Takumi, you have to have 60,000 hours of experience. So I think I'm getting there. But like the Japanese, I think it's always important to remember we can always be better at what we do. So I've started with a couple of definitions because certainly within the UK, the idea of recycling and reuse is gaining currency. But it's very important to remember that recycling, which we can do with glass 100%, is perfectly possible, but sustainability is a bigger idea. And I thank Piero for explaining earlier that sustainability is also about keeping people in work, keeping these companies going, keeping the beautiful product that we make available for consumers to buy. So sustainability is just as important as recyclability. So the fact we can take a glass bottle and remake it into another bottle a hundred times is really, really important, but it's not entirely the idea of sustainability. So if we could have the next slide, please. So as I get older, I become increasingly interested in the history of glass, about what's been done previously and what is the material it can offer people. So there's some examples here which show that Roman glass previously was made containing antimony. Antimony is a refining agent. 
but we can see from the illustration there that over time, this glass was recycled into new glass and, and a new composition was developed. So what I'm saying is glass makers have always been able to identify useful materials that might be out there, to bring them into their process and to make new glass and make new things with it. So as a community, we have always been fabulous at recycling. We have always been very good at identifying new sources of raw material that can help us to make the glass that we want to make. So that's great. If we can have the next slide, please. That's fabulous. So Christopher Merritt, who's the guy who claimed, like a lot of English people, claims to have invented something that now is a bigger currency in Europe. So Merritt is one of the guys who was supposed to have invented sharp, say, sparkling wine, which turned into champagne. <coughs> Excuse me. But Merritt looked at Christopher, uh, ne uh, Antonio Neri, who looked at glass making all around Europe. And this is a lovely illustration from one of his things, which I use in quite a few of my teaching talks, where we can see all the elements of glass making are present within this picture. So at the top, we have people recovering clay to make pots. We can see there's some deforestation of the hills there because those materials can go to produce the ingredients for our glass. We can have a glass house, which I think all of us will recognize as not being too different to the glass house you could go and see in Murano nowadays. Two things that I really like on the right hand side to the bottom of that, on the left hand side to the bottom is that, first of all, we have a gentleman there who's obviously carrying out some elements of quality assurance or quality assessment. So that's always been important to glass makers. And just at the bottom of a the picture, there's a bin which I believe represents recycling, that that glass is not fit for purpose and will go back into the process. So that's a really useful illustration. But what Merritt also identified was that the use of ashes, biomass, other things like that can be part of glass making. So instead of having to use manufactured chemicals, we can go and find other things that might be useful. So if we could have the next slide, please. That's perfect. So we've been doing some work over here in the UK where the production of electricity by burning wood and other biomass materials is gaining currency because it's part of the picture for sustainable energy. But part of that process produce ash and this ash at the moment can't be used. However, we were able to identify that looking at the history and looking at the composition of the materials and I promised Emmanuel we won't get too far into the science of it. So there are things within the ash that are useful to glass makers. And what we've been able to do is to start to recover this material to do some scientific work and start to reintroduce it back into glass making. It's really aimed at containing the glass, as you can see there, I wouldn't get most of that green glass past your quality assurance department in terms of the stuff that you might make of Vanini or the beautiful glass that we might see over there. However, you can see it's possible to introduce significant amounts of recovered material into the glass. So the advantage being we've burnt the wood, we've got generated electricity, a reusable, recyclable power, and we can then use the ash to make more glass. So that's the kind of thing that we're really interested in is being able to identify opportunities for new materials to go into glass. And I'll just say a little bit more about that if I may. We work with the big energy users with the ceramics industry, with the steel, with the paper, cement, chemicals, all those people. And we've been able to put together an excellent program where individual companies can identify their potential wastes and that waste can then go into the glass or could be reused or, you know, so it's essentially, it's only a waste to you. It might be useful to someone else. So that's one of the things that I think is a really interesting initiative and something we could possibly explore. So the next slide, please. So I've also talked about, as I say, going back to history. So I found an example of Uber's glass house, which is in Bristol in 1720. And what was really interesting to me was one, the glass house doesn't look that different apart from they haven't got a cone, so a different way of working, but in essence, it's all about sustainability, it's about recycling, and it's also about cooperation. So these activities weren't solely glass houses. Lots of people would work within it. So you can see, as well as the glass maker, there's a surgeon, an innkeeper, a malt maker. So you would imagine that's where some of your product is going to go into those bottles. But we've also got marines, a sugar guy, some merchants. And last of all is a soap boiler. And a soap boiler might seem an unusual person to associate with a glass house. But the truth is the lye, one of the ingredients for the glass, is also useful to the salt making process. So there we have a nice example of cooperation inter inter industrial interaction where people are able to use, <coughs> excuse me, other people's things to move their process forward. So I thought that was say historically very interesting and an indication of what glass makers can do when challenged. So the next slide, please. So one of the things I want to say about this ash for large scale production, not for artistic glass, but it's an indication of the sort of things that can be done. If we can use this ash, it's possible to reduce the amount of sand that's dug up, the amount of limestone that's removed, the, lime, the amount of dolomite that's removed. So we're increasing our recycled content. And that's one of the things that 
container consumers are interested in, how much recycled material can we get in there? Because that's one of the metrics that people started to use, but we're also saving CO2. So there are options out there to consider all of those things. And if you could just have the last slide, please. Thank you. And this is, this is the sort of thing that I think is going to be seen within the container industry, but I think these sorts of initiatives will also be brought to bear on small scale glass producers. We had a very good discussion yesterday where we found that, you know, the amount of glass produced in Murano is very, very small. So the impact on the environment is small, but you will still be looked at. And it, it's very clear to me that small guys can make a big difference. So if you're some of the first people who get in and bring these technologies on board, that's one, a credit to yourselves and two, gives you a, a much more sustainable, much lower carbon footprint. So things like biodiesel, things like hydrogen are also gaining currency. Piero was good enough to discuss some of the electric melting. Now I'm a research guy, I've been a research guy for the last 30 years. I'm never disappointed to find out that someone else has always done something because it's generally in the past, it generally didn't work for reasons, but we've got 10, 20 years <coughs> like of improvements to this technology. So a chance to go back and re-explore this would be really, really interesting. We've also talked about pelletization and materials we use. So what opportunities exist within those small firms within Murano to share materials that they can't use, but somebody else may be able to use for. And this too is about finding alternative sources to bring materials in to reduce your CO2 usage. So I'd like to say as a scientist, I can't make beautiful things. I can't design beautiful things. I can't innovate beautiful things, but I can help to make better glass. And if we can make the glass better, then the process that follows from there, I think is much easier. And that, that's what I think my role is, is to support with technology and science and lead the artistic people to do the artistic things at which they are best. And I know Antonio has got some good stuff to talk about on that front as well. So thank you for listening to me. I hope that was useful. Oh. Uh, thank you, Martin. I'm it's especially thank you for this uh, positive, optimistic message. I can say that uh, um, to add your presentation, that the city of Venice uh, is investing about uh, resources, is investing in uh, hydrogen uh, production. Yes. So oh, exactly, is investing to use uh, the hydrogen as uh, a waste of the industrial production of Porto Marghera to use as a fuel. So as a green uh, um, fuel for uh, starting from uh, uh, starting with uh, the um, um, public transportation, uh, local public transportation, uh, the buses, but also for uh, the boat. Uh, so that in the future can be this connection with the uh, uh, production in uh, uh, Porto Marghera, you know, with this uh, chemical uh, uh, industry and uh, maybe uh, what is waste uh, for Porto Marghera can be uh, the energy for uh, the Murano production. But okay, but going on, on with the scientists. Uh, so, uh, Antonio Matos, please, uh, you present the slide for Antonio. Thank you. Okay. Good morning um, to everyone. Um, I should say first that I am a radiochemist that worked more than 40 years in the Portuguese nuclear laboratory. In the end of my career, I was invited by the University of Lisboa to give lectures in conservation and restoration. In 2001, so 20 years ago, in collaboration with colleagues of fine arts, we founded VCART, which is a research unit where artists, scientists, conservators, and art historians and archaeologists work. The interaction between them has been quite successful. VCART is the partnership between two universities, as written in the slide. Um, I am now a collaborative, after all these years, I am now a collaborative member. And uh, when I was, um, um, when I had the limit of age, uh, I could not continue to teach uh, and to, to have an official uh, position. So I was substituted by Marcia Villarix, who is a very, very good um, uh, director. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the things I'm going to, to talk about. Glass production should become more eco-friendly, how to decrease and also eliminate CO2 for the glass blowing artist studios. Recycling small quantities of glass work for, uh, um, quantities of glass for artwork is just a, a small example. And more research is needed, is what I am just saying. Next slide, please. Uh, the glass color is in danger. So the yellow, orange, and red with cadmium, as everybody knows, 
is in danger. Next, please. So these are examples of the three nice colors. I know that in Murano, uh, they like very much vivid colors, but a few centuries before, they had also very, very beautiful work. Uh, but okay, we are now in the uh, 21st century, so the um, way of thinking about class is different. Next, please. The danger of cadmium. Cadmium is a carcinogenic element, and Murano is contaminated with it due to the quantity of class studios. This is what I was told a couple of years ago. Only a scrubber or a, scrubber or a special filter can eliminate this danger. As you may know, Bullseye has long known that they adopt the use of special filtering. As you may know, uh, the population near, uh, near the Bullseye is, is, is still very scarce. The quantity um, of um, uh, cadmium that is still going out is only 0.2%. Zero, zero uh, next slide, please. Uh, alternatives to red glass and yellow glass. This is just a different, different uh, uh, approach. Uh, next slide, please. So we have the copper. This is an example of the 21st century glass that you find in any shop. Uh, copper is, it's, can really substitute the, uh, the red color. Uh, we find examples in, in medieval age but everybody says that is more difficult. But if cadmium cannot be used, well, there is no other alternative. Next slide, please. This is a, a ruby gold. So if you think about red, you can use also gold. And uh, there are a lot of use, different use of, of uh, color. And you can red, you can get a very, very deep red color. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, some experiment we made. Uh, by coating. Uh, I know that the glass blowing artists don't, don't think about coating, but some of the pieces can, can work uh, with this kind of coating. This is a spray, uh, spray pyrolysis method. Next, next slide, please. And uh, you can get coating glass, you can get the red. Uh, this, this is an experiment and uh, in collaboration with the Nuclear Institute, we analyze the, the, the surface and the, the, the quantity of glass that was on the surface. Next, please. Uh, and also uh, for the yellow, silver can be used. You can find in the literature. In this case, it was an invention of uh, um, our uh, research unit where we use a, a mirror, we heat, and you can get this yellow color. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, and this yellow color was used already by uh, uh, one of uh, artists, Belay Uriel that made an exposition of lots of pieces using this kind of uh, technique in, the best, in one of the best galleries in Lisbon. Next, please. Uh, until now, there is no compound that in glass gives the vivid yellow color. If the glass studios cannot install special filters, the contamination on the air would be very dangerous. dangerous. To get the large uh, the range of colors, yellow, orange, and red, the cadmium is needed. Unfortunately, the research made until now do not solve the problem. More research is needed. Even so, most of the chemists don't believe that the, that the yellow can be obtained. So we need really filters. I know that uh, the, the factories in, in Murano are very small, so they, can, they, they have no money to get very, very, uh, expensive scrubber. So I don't know the, the solution. I am not proposing anything. We can talk that after when we start the discussion. Next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, this I showed in uh, 2018 in the um, uh, Glass Art Society meeting. So you have very vivid and nice colors in Murano. Uh, but suppose that you take the um, cadmium and selenium uh, next slide is just uh, um, next slide, please. It's just what happens if you have these colors. This is a Photoshop work, but you get these uh, well, very, very uh, um, unfortunately colors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how to decrease and also eliminate the CO two from the glass blowing artistic studies? This is uh, um, this is something where, where Martin is specialist, but I just give a, a small reference. Uh, can you, can I say, can I 
Uh, see the next slide, please. Uh, electric furnaces, you talk already about it. This is important. E electric glory holes can be implemented in studios. Some of the artists, they say, ah, well, it's not so good, but we, th we cannot continue to use gas. We cannot continue to pollute. Uh, small microwave furnace can be used. I don't know who is, fact who is doing that. In 2012, in uh, Amsterdam, I saw a small microwave furnace in the Glass Art Society meeting, and they can do glass blowing in small quantities. But as you know, we are in the 21st century, so we can do very, very large things. For the next generation, and when the electricity is the main source of energy, the CO2 can be reduced. This is the hydrogen project. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a small example of recycling small quantities of glass from a for artworks. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, this is an artist from Heller Gallery in New York. Uh, and the, the next slides you can show uh, more fast, okay. Uh, and all this work was made using colors from different factories that they didn't use anymore, that kind of, of glass. And the artists went to several factories to, to find that and uh, to find small quantities of glass that would not be used anymore. And they can do very interesting artworks. And as you see in the next two slides that you can go on uh, uh, fast. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is very interesting because they only use a glass torch and uh, uh, not consuming energy uh, and there is no pollution and so on. And uh, now to finalize, um, uh, excuse me, uh, next slide. Um, most of the glass made is based on empirical experiments. This is something that happened in the 16th century, and I think now it's still uh, going on. There is no uh, research. Without research, it is impossible to progress in the glass field color. I don't know if uh, Murano has a good uh, laboratory of research. Uh, a successful example was made after 2018, uh, Dwight glass for filigree, fil filigree work was made by using several compositions. Um, and the, the two successful um, uh, results of research were made, one by Cristiano Ferro from a factory that uh, produces the old Mora, uh, old Moretti, um, I think it's Moretti, no? No, not, not Moretti, I don't remember the name. Uh, but as you know, is the, the largest factory that produces glass color for everybody and for all the world. And in the US, uh, Mark Paiser also made a, a very interesting work. Uh, uh, now, the next slides, I will show uh, uh, some uh, filigree work on the next slides, please. Uh, this is on the 16th century. They didn't use arsenic. Se second slide. Uh, they didn't use arsenic also. This is uh, from 18th century. Ne next one, please. This is a work made by Giuliano Ballarini uh, with lead arsenate. Uh, it's, it's really very beautiful. I, I have no example of the um, um, Cristiano Ferro, but he, is, he could already do also white glass using another technique. Um, and uh, um, the next two slides are from Mark Pais. The next two slides, please. Uh, and this is um, this is an invention of Mark Peiser. No arsenic is used. There is um, there is a, a bit of the titanium, and this is a patent that is already sold to Bullseye. And that's thank you very much. I think I didn't exceed my time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Antonio. <laughs> Uh, very nice. So, and then at the end, I have a question for you. But uh, just after you, I would like to listen to Emmanuel Bablet because uh, Bonjour. to uh, together and uh, the scientists and the artists. And so now we we listen. We who is uh, uh, working the material, uh, choosing the color and working the material. Uh, Emmanuel and si. hello, hello. Hello everyone. Yeah, I've been working with glass. I have the chance to be working with glass for 30 years in Murano. So I have a certain experience and I have seen the curve of the evolution of the availability of glass and colors and problematic in, in Murano. 
Uh, first of all, I remember the 90s when the filter have become obligatory, the, the certain kind of filter uh, that can, um, let's say, filter not 97% of, uh, of the dust and the chemical emanation. Uh, have been already a very hard and difficult uh, passage. Many furniture at the time already have been obliged to close. And uh, and from them, we know that many hotels have been, have been built in Morano and so on. So I think there is a depopulation of the island that we are ready to care. And I think there is a very huge fragility of the situation and an urgency to react to the situation if we uh, want to maintain the, the quality and the leadership that Morano represent. I um, totally agree with uh, this panel about the necessity to act on, um, on the more sustainable production of glass. Uh, but I am also here to, uh, warm, to, warm, uh, to make a warning about the fact that uh, uh, the necessity we are evocating can also kill, uh, kill the glass itself and the makers themselves because of, uh, not because of emanation, but because of uh, suffocation. Uh, so we have to be very um, careful when we propose solution uh, to respect also the dimension and the size of Murano and the uh, eligibility of this reality uh, to be accused of uh, making uh, uh, emanation where well, we have 60 million of cars in Italy and we have only a few for in Murano. So I'm mean, just, just to re reposition that discussion. So of course, very important the development of the electrical oven. I am sure this is a, this is a very important uh, because electricity is renewable, uh, because wind is always there, and so on. So I think uh, there is uh, for sure an effort, but need to be to be sustained. Uh, so because I think there is two general, as you introduced, Paul, there is two very general question. One is uh, emanation of CO2 of the oven because to make glass is night and day very large quantity of glass are burned to, uh, to, to, to melt the glass. So of course, that may be a transition to electricity and that would be probably uh, a, a more uh, a positive evolution. Um, the second, uh, and, so, and maybe also not only to, to, to move to electricity, but also to use this emanation of heat from this, uh, all this uh, cheminée uh, to make warm water to uh, produce electricity to move the boat and so on so try to find a virtuous uh, pattern in the fact that we are consuming gas in all electricity and producing this kind of uh, uh, high temperatures that can be uh, basically uh, used for other uh, uh, positive uh, cycle uh, the second is the composition of the glass and composition of the glass is a very very a great question. We know that Murano have been for um, centuries leader for color, for invention, um, and um, nowadays the restriction that uh, occur. I've, I've seen in my um, experience many colors and materials slowly disappear. Uh, it's a case of, the, of course, of the Opala that uh, use arsenic and was. Uh, the great, great Murano of uh, the Reticello, the Zanfirico, and, and the filigree in general, we heard by, uh, uh, you know, by Antonio Pires de Mato that solution seems to appear and that patent have been done. And I hope there will be not only patent, but it will be usable uh, uh, by a Murano maker. Um, I think uh, it's, it's important nowadays that we, uh, we, there, is a, there is a general um, let's say, conscience uh, from all the Moranos people that they, they need to be more unified uh, to front the problem of this uh, material. As uh, Antonio also underlined, the red and the yellow and the orange will maybe disappear from the palette of Murano. I did myself three years ago, is why I'm so passionate by this question, uh, a glass of my series Pyros that was fully, that the Pyros series used beautiful color that was provided by Venini. And I need one example uh, of a totally white glass. Um, to, to, it was a, a, a statement, a, a denunciation of the situation and the inertia uh, that is around this, uh, this uh, empowerment of, uh, of Murano. Mm. So I think uh, we really need, uh, my, my call as a, um, as a designer, 
I'm not a glassmaker myself, but I work with glassmaker, is that any solution we will uh, contemplate in this panel should first uh, understand what is the specificity of the glass of Murano, the plasticity of this material that, have, that is completely different from the crystal and other materials that are long glass, that are short glass. The, the glass of Murano is a long glass. It is a glass that you can work for more time uh, and to, it's a glass that has a certain plasticity and need a certain component, like uh, arsenic was used at time to um, avoid bubble. I mean, there's a lot of technical questions that should be included uh, in, 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 the, in the content of any solution, because again, I think it's very important that we don't uh, uh, transform the glass of Murano uh, with the um, scope with the objective to make it green, but at the end, uh, we may have a glass of Murano that is not anymore anything of what uh, is the beauty of the glass of Murano. So is my, my participation here is just to say that this uh, Murano glass is absolutely uh, incredible in the, compared to many other situations of production for the purity, for the, the, the specificity of each fornage, for the color that you can find, for the techniques that are being still uh, alive on this island. Uh, so mm, I'm really pleased to be part of this panel to sensibilize uh, again about the thematic. Um, it's, uh, it's not only, so my call is about this fragility. I think we can go further in the discussion, Paola, um, after this uh, call that I would like to do. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, um, I know we, we discussed many times. I know your position, <clears throat> and I really love uh, your position. You say the glass of Murano is uh, unique, uh, is special. Uh, it's, uh, we, we are talking about uh, small numbers uh, compared with the pollution. Uh, try to do our best, all, all of us, try to do our best to keep the glass of Murano uh, like it has been for many years, uh, talking about colors, uh, materials, uh, plasticity, as you say, I know. And uh, I think this uh, could be also uh, one of the way to uh, pursue it uh, for, uh, for the sustainability of the glass of Murano. I totally agree with you. Yeah. I just want to add, yes, in fact, the sustainability uh, has to be, you know, it's not only an accusation. We should also see if the world is sustainable for Murano. <laughs> Uh, that uh, is not only in one sense, but in a both sense. What do we want to keep? You yeah. know, how we want to make our effort to maintain art in our society. So I think the question is a, 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 a double side, you know, like, oh, that's what is my message too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I really thank you to, to show this side because uh, <clears throat> for me as a city manager, it's very important to keep this kind of sustainability culture and uh, uh, the population active and to keep the tradition. Uh, so now we go to Roberto and Roberto also can give us uh, a, a perspective of the last 30 years. I've, I've been working so uh, so into Murano for, for almost, I think, 30 years and uh, uh, as an art uh, curator. So it's, uh, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Um, good morning. My name is Roberto Gasparotto. I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, I thank Camilla Pardon of Venice Glass Week and Paola Ravenna of uh, Comune di Venezia. Uh, so let's start from this. Uh, when somebody visits a glass furnace in Murano, they are all fascinated by the fire, but also by the pragmatic matter of the hot glass uh, and from the small solid pieces of glass that are production waste. Everybody would love to have them as souvenir. This impressed me always. And also when artists or designer came and see this fluid hot glass or multicolor pieces, a creative uh, process immediately uh, begin in their mind. And they used to make this question, what we can do with these pieces? Or they make this question, can we give a second life to this production? So in fact, sustainability, it means also a possibility to recycle the pieces of some component or some components coming from uh, a production. Um, and this could be a second meaning. But to recycle Murano glass is a challenge. 
is that maybe it's not uh, is not very simple challenge. I have to say, it seems that because also most of the clients see Murano glass as one of the example of perfection of pure color in transparency. But it's not always true because there are also a beautiful example in uh, bases of lamp with uh, different components within techniques or melted color. So I want to underline that art and Murano glass in terms of creativity, um, they inspired the, from one center even today, a possibility to combine different, different te techniques. And so this is my, I want to provo provoke a discussion. Can we say that try to mix techniques or including piecing coming from previous production is a sort of first step of recycling glass? No or yes? I mean, I was thinking uh, in these days, if it's yes, I want uh, if, uh, if Yes, I want to, um, can, you, can we mention different artists that uh, in the past and even today um, try, reach a beautiful example is also with a timeless, uh, timeless style. For example, um, I want to say even Dino Martens, Carlo Scarpa and Fulvio Bianconi love to mix component, for example, Murine or metal leaves. We have not to forget uh, for, for Venini the famous vetrate, the, let's say the glass panels done by Gio Ponti with uh, Tony Zuccheri around the 60s, where they used to introduce a small piece of solid glass coming from fused uh, glass, called his name is uh, Cotissi, and also with a sm uh, small touch of color or also some metal part. Another uh, important project is this uh, kind of uh, mix uh, of um, pieces, broken pieces, as uh, done in 1992 with Mario Bellini, also for Venini. That's, uh, he presented a strange project for that time, very innovative, uh, where the idea was to apply the broken pieces, part of components from daily Venini production, upon three large shapes uh, in glass. Um, he was thinking to give to these pieces a second life. And this, uh, I always love this uh, uh, translation instead uh, to use worsted glass. And the name, in fact, of the collection was uh, Sony Infranti, that's mean uh, broken dreams, uh, meaning to create uh, dreams with memories. Another example around 2009, 2010, with the Campanas brother from Brazil, we start to with Indy with a project of lighting called fragments. That means a small part of glass applied in this case on a metal net. But for them, this was more to uh, introduce, to speak about memories of uh, glass vocabularies, where I used pieces from uh, masters in or some techniques so we can uh, have a second life in this uh, in this lamp uh, another example not in murano for example to me was in 1983 by the memphis uh, group uh, the milanese collection of memphis i always uh, remember this table designed by the designer shiro kuramata and the table was named Kyoto. In this case, uh, the glass part, the pieces was used like the famous floor, the terrazzo technique. So uh, recycle piece of glass inside of the resin of cement. But uh, um, we have not to forget, and this is maybe more like to the, close to the discussion today, that this research and development is uh, not simple and uh, and uh, is not uh, quick and also represent uh, an high cost for the companies, uh, for the glass companies. So because sometimes it happens with good result or not good result. So what can happen in the future? For example, to me, it's, uh, it's um, because add pieces or combining wasted pieces is not very new. To me, it would be better to investigate in the field of melting glass, uh, to provoke artists to research uh, a new idea, example, use uh, and create art pieces with melted glass. So uh, forget of uh, colors, pure colors as uh, this yellow, this uh, gold, uh, red. So 
also to improve that is the, an impure colors to get very beautiful art piece. Uh, maybe some somebody can try. And uh, this is my um, final uh, word. And please, and back to you, Paola. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, with your uh, huge uh, culture about uh, the production of, uh, uh, of glass and very nice. Uh, I love this word, the second life uh, of uh, glass uh, could be one of, uh, um, of uh, the different uh, uh, way that we have to, um, to follow for the sustainability. So now we are uh, ah, close to the end. Um, uh, so, uh, I uh, go to the end. Uh, I would like uh, just to say that, uh, to sum up, that it's clear now that, they, that we have a new, uh, we have to um, cope, to, uh, to manage a new phase of the um, artistic glass production. The new phase uh, goes toward the sustainability uh, in the broad sense, like we explored today. I would like to ask to the panelists in a very, very short, uh, like I have to say five words, uh, uh, if uh, uh, can Murano lead uh, this transformation? Can Murano, and, and of course, uh, in which way? But uh, really a few words, we have uh, almost, uh, we are almost uh, uh, till the end. Uh, Following the same uh, um, order that uh, we did the presentation, so starting from, uh, uh, from Piero, I would ask you uh, if Murano can lead this transformation towards sustainability, of course, like, like we said, keeping his identity. Uh, with the help uh, I, I had uh, of the city of Venice and uh, maybe the entire international communities, community, uh, uh, for sure, the Europe can lead this phase, uh, and uh, in a few words, uh, how? Uh, Piero, you are the first. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yeah, you are. So, uh, yes, I think uh, that uh, uh, Murano could uh, could be go home with the, in this way of the sustainability and uh, uh, change his uh, uh, behavior, I think, uh, he, uh, has to change the, his behavior, has to change the mentality. Uh, as I told before, uh, we have to, to make the action now because uh, the, te the technology is uh, available. Uh, the, the scientists study a lot uh, in the past, uh, even today. And so we have to apply what we have uh, now. Uh, and. Uh, what we could do in the future for this, uh, this. and uh, uh, as I told before, uh, is a problem. I think that the, 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 the main problem is to have the ideas and the programs and to find the financial resources. So, okay, Pierre, I received the message, and okay, Martin, see you. For me, that's really, it's been some fantastic discussion. I've really enjoyed listening to it. For me, because Venice is already looking at hydrogen, and hydrogen could be used to fire the glory holes, which you know is an important part of what they do. So perhaps include those glory holes as part of the hydrogen use, which then includes Murano as part of this development. I think Roberto's idea of a second life is absolutely beautiful. So one of the things I would do was maybe look at who's got what wastes, what waste, what spare materials generated on Murano, and then try and find someone who could use that. You know, so try and encourage this cooperation where people look and well, actually, if that's not suitable for your particular product or production, perhaps we could bring that on board and use that for something else. But as Piero says, technology needs to be combined with an intention and some finance, because unfortunately, it's money that pulls these things through. So finance for it is, as for all R&D, that's a difficult thing to achieve, but there's certainly a will there. And absolutely no doubt in my head that glassmakers are perfectly capable of adapting, of developing, of innovating and of making new things once challenged to do so. Okay, thank you, Martin. Antonio? Um, yes, as you know, I like very much Murano, uh, but I am quite, uh, well, um, how, how can I say? Uh, it, it, there is a danger about cadmium. Uh, um, my Emmanuel Ma Ma Bambalet was saying that is only a small contamination in the hair. <laughs> and uh, well, but it is uh, Murano uh, with everybody there that is in danger. So uh, 
we have to do more research on that. And this is difficult. Uh, as you know, I, I have been working with John Parker, which is one of the persons that know uh, a lot of color, glass colors uh, and is, is a very good scientist and very well known every, everywhere. And uh, what happened is that we cannot find a solution for cadmium, probably with a very long research, which would, would cost a lot. And uh, the other thing, it's uh, concerning the uh, fluidity of glass. The fluidity of glass is available everywhere. It's available uh, in Czech Republic, it's available in America, it's available everywhere. So I, don't, I didn't understand Emmanuel about that. Um, um, so uh, what I say, if we don't have a research institute or a research place in Murano, uh, for solving the problems, that would be very, very bad for Murano. As you know, I like very much Murano, and I would not like to... Uh, concerning the colors, the bullseye is really leading with all possible colors. They are very, very good. And when we, I talked about the filigree, it's not... A, 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 they have a patent, but they are already producing that with a name which I don't remember. Uh, and uh, they have titanium, and this should be very interesting for Murano to do research on that area and to do some something similar. Well, I don't take you more time, sorry. Okay, Antonio, uh, for the cadmium, we will study more maybe the system of reduction of pollution, not eliminate it totally. <laughs> but, but okay. I, I, how, how you do that? I don't know, with the technology, system of uh, reduction of the pollution. The, uh, how, with filters? With filters, exactly. Yes, but they are so expensive. A filter for a small factory is more expensive than the factory. Okay. We will <laughs> well, of course, investing in research, like you say. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think, um, I think Morano, of course, is so fragile. Uh, of course, maybe we cannot solve the cadmium. And sorry, Antonio, I didn't mean that the cadmium was not a problem. It's completely a problem. And the, the, yeah, the, okay. of course... The, the 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 health of people is the first thing first. Um, I just mean about maybe the emanation the emanation of CO two. It was more about wow. the gas production compared to the full in the Italian industry. Because just like you know, to just relativize. But of course, uh, cadmium is a problem. We study it together. We have seen the filter. We have seen all the question of the of the pollution. And uh, we know that uh, if it's done on certain terms and certain control. Cadmium can be used, but of course, it will not be totally restricted. So, what we can do as an artist, I say, we will not use red and orange and, 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 and yellow anymore, but glass will be still beautiful. Uh, what I say is, Murano can be the future of this, uh, uh, is this evolution and revolution to a more green glass. I say yes, because as Murano is fragile and small, it's also maybe, uh, let's say, the, the um, I think, the, um, the size. Of, structure to make uh, to apply research uh, it's uh, also the historical jewel for glass so it's may if we will uh, make improvement on this island i think it can mm, be uh, be extended and be seen uh, by the rest of the world so i think it's a very good uh, um, situation uh, to use it's a very good time time already also uh, to concentrate our intention about how Murano can become green and give the example to the world. Uh, we will have to lose something. We will have to lose the red, and maybe we will lose the red, or we will lose gold to do red, and we make uh, the Rubino. Why not? I mean, I, don't, I am very optimist. What we need is the attention of the world to maintain uh, this, uh, this incredible arts uh, and help this uh, island to be uh, more sustainable, of course. Okay, thank you, Manuel. Roberto? Yes, uh, of course, I agree. A center of research uh, for, uh, for the pollution, uh, for the sustainability, is will be very important to have in Murano, but also a school for new, uh, for the glass master. And also, to me, also maybe um, some uh, research to try to find a message in the marketing, because uh, um, I have to, to see for the people around the client to understand that Murano glass is expensive also because uh, honestly it's not perfect in Murano today, but 
compared to decades ago, the, the air, the pollution is little better, maybe just little, but it's better. And what's happening in the other part of the world where the glass are produced? So because this is a cost, I mean, ideally it cannot be only Murano, it should be all over the other center. And there are other center in the around the world because I cannot think uh, if it will be hypothetical to reach the result of totally clean production. What is only Murano and the other part of the, uh, the world? What's that? What's, uh, what's happening uh, over there? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to say that uh, uh, collecting all uh, your um, intervention, uh, I want to give a positive message uh, to the city, to the island, especially because I heard that there are now a new initiative of a uh, uh, new generation uh, of uh, young uh, uh, people uh, producing uh, um, artistic glass uh, from Murano. I'm so happy about this. So the positive message is that uh, as a city uh, has to invest, uh, try to invest in find the resource, extra resources for uh, researches. So uh, we have to go, go on with the research, but there is uh, already some research. Uh, and then uh, with the school, as Roberto said, and uh, the individuality, speciality of Murano has to, uh, has to be, um, has to use also the international, the global uh, uh, new solution that was found in another country so, uh, with the aspiration Roberto said. So it's individually, it's a, a really an heritage, uh, this production of glass. Uh, unique, uh, but has to look uh, also abroad uh, the solution and uh, to combine with the others. Thank you all the panelists. Uh, panelists, <laughs> thank you all the panelists. Uh, was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I would, I would love to say on behalf of the Venice Glass Week to you all, um, thank you so much for this genuinely genuinely fascinating conversation on what is obviously an incredibly important topic. You know, it's been so wonderful to have your diverse range of perspectives, you know, from the scientific to the artistic, international to local, environmental, cultural, social. What has become apparent as well through this conversation is that it is not simple. Um, it's incredibly complex. And I think, Paolo, you've done a brilliant job today of, of um, <laughs> giving, giving an overview of quite how complicated um, and, and the, the issue is. So um, really, really brilliant. You know, the Venice Glass Week is a festival which aims in part to celebrate and promote the art of glass here in Venice. And we celebrate the beauty of glass, the rich tradition of Murano glass. But of course, it's obviously really important that we don't just look at things through rose tinted or cadmium tinted spectacles. We, we need to look <coughs> and consider thing, the challenges that face us um, and that are facing the industry. And I think it's important that the Venice Glass Week and our audience, um, both local and international, are, are actually confronting reality. And so you have I, no doubt opened a lot of people's eyes um, to a lot of the, the challenges that, that have faced. Um, and I think it's really great that we didn't just have a one track conversation that we, we consider both some of the many challenges that are being faced. So yeah, thank you very much again for adding this to our program. And I hope that we can continue um, to, to, to collaborate together. And we obviously need to to continue engaging in this um, aspect, very important aspect. If Murano is to continue, not just to survive, but to thrive as, as a leading center of glass excellence. And as Emmanuel said, to, to set an example as a leader or pioneer in the field. So thank you to our sponsor, Apice, represented here today by Helen. We're really grateful to you for facilitating this conversation um, and enabling us to open up this conversation to the world. Um, to everybody who's been watching, from home. Um, thank you very much for joining us. The conversation will also be um, uploaded to YouTube so people will be able to watch it and we can share it if they haven't joined. Um, and obviously thank you to our panel, um, to all of you. We really appreciate your insights and your perspectives um, and hope we can continue to, to work together in the future. And to Paula, thank you again for moderating. So yeah, um, I think that's that's sadly all we've got time for today um, and really look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you, Camila. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Oh.